Keep in mind, two weeks prior, Lois Hammer, right? No way can this happen within two weeks in Granvers County. Hello, listeners. We're Shedding Light, and I'm Candy. I'm Angela. And I'm Susie. And we're hell-bent on shedding light on unsolved missing persons cases across Canada. In an attempt to find the missing piece of the puzzle. What you are about to listen to is the culmination of countless hours of research. In an attempt to gather as many facts as possible about the case by reading news articles, online blogs and forums, and by interviewing friends, family, and people involved in the case. We will discuss different theories and possibilities and pick them apart in order to evaluate their likelihood. Or better yet, eliminate them. We weren't there. We don't claim to know what happened. We can only try to paint a picture using the resources that we do have. We don't claim anything to be fact that isn't. We don't claim our interviewees' words to be fact. It's their memory. It's their recollection. It's their truth, and it's their opinion. And everybody's entitled to one. That does not mean we necessarily share any of these opinions. And listeners, please remember, everyone, including the suspects, is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Please bear that in mind as we welcome you to to Season 5, Episode 2, The Search for Lisa. Produced in partnership with Please Bring Me Home and sponsored by Bruce Power. Ontario's long-term energy plan is counting on Bruce Power to provide a reliable and carbon-free source of affordable energy through to 2064. To do so, Bruce Power has signed a long-term agreement with the province to refurbish six of its eight units, investing $13 billion private dollars into these publicly owned assets. Bruce Power's Life Extension Program will create and sustain 22,000 jobs annually while injecting $4 billion into Ontario's economy each year. Just a heads up that there is some foul language and adult content in here. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, listeners. If you are just tuning in for the first time, we encourage you to hop back to Episode 1 in this season. Lisa is Missing. In order to bring yourselves up to speed on the case of Lisa Reimer Mays, and for those of you that have been following along, we look forward to continuing to share her story with you, beginning with the search efforts. Hi everyone, Susie here, and just to clarify, I'm not still sick weeks later. We're just recording episode two the same night, so please bear with me on my laryngitis. Uh, First, before we get into this too much, just a brief recap. Shortly after leaving her husband of two years, 22-year-old Lisa began dating Roy and became pregnant with her first child. She got back into the group of friends that she had known previous to her marriage. After a short and rocky relationship, Lisa broke up with Roy when she was five months pregnant. She wanted to move back in with her parents and called her dad to come and pick her up with all of her belongings. We have come to learn that Lisa then spent that day with a friend and her baby in Sobel Beach, which was not what she told her parents she was doing. She told them she had to drive a friend and their baby to Orangeville. Her parents went to a wedding that day, which Lisa was supposed to attend as well, but she chose not to go. That was the last time that Ken and June Reimer saw their daughter. That same evening... Lisa drove her green 1976 Plymouth Fury and met up with a female friend and her two sisters. Her friend and one of the sisters joined Lisa at a bar in Owen Sound. The bar was called the Company Inn. Susie and I knew that place well. We were there a few times, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Lisa's friend actually posted the sequence of events on a public forum in March of 2010. It read... My sister and I were with Lisa the night she disappeared. She had left her boyfriend and was very distraught, so we decided to go to the bar. Lisa was drinking white Russians without alcohol as she was pregnant. We ran into Ron at the bar, or Roy as we call him, which made Lisa more upset. 
We all heard about a party out in Woodford after the bar. My sister and Lisa were the only ones from our group that wanted to go. As Lisa was staying at my house that night, she left with my sister. They drove to Gary's, where they called me and told me they were leaving Lisa's car there and taking Gary's car to the party. When my sister returned very drunk from the party and Lisa was not with her, she said she lost track of her and got a ride back to town with a friend. By 6 a.m., I did not hear from Lisa, so I called Gary's house. He told me he watched her get in her car, drive down the long driveway, and turn left towards Highway 26 to town. Worried is when I called the police, who came right away and questioned me. So you can read that on the Facebook group page, if you like. Gary's house in Annan was only about 11 kilometers north of the bar that the girls went to in Owen Sound. And it was his brother who was having the party in Woodford, just another 10 kilometers east from Gary's. It is our understanding that Lisa told her friend that she did not want Roy to know she was at the party, which is why she left her car at Gary's. There have been a couple of variations of the exact events leading up to arriving at the party, one of which includes a fourth person who possibly joined the trio once at Gary's place. According to Gary, he and Lisa left the party alone at approximately 4 a.m., drove back to his place, and he allegedly watched Lisa get into her car at around 4.30 a.m. and drive south back towards Owen Sound. That was the last time anyone would ever see Lisa Reimer Mays. There were claims that Lisa was seen in Owen Sound on Sunday. Immediately, her case was taken on by the Owen Sound City Police. People claimed they'd seen Lisa in Owen Sound on the Sunday. So now whether that's clearly that wasn't true or not, now whether that was someone being malicious and leading the police in the wrong direction, or whether it was someone just seeing someone and thinking, oh, that looks like Lisa. Unfortunately, they initially surmised that she just ran off and was partying and staying with friends. Could it have been the stigma attached to Lisa's name due to the crowd she was hanging around with at the time that caused police to feel less urgency in her disappearance, value her life less? And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my opinion, Lisa having the personality that she had, police didn't take it seriously off the hop. And it was because, you know, oh, she'll return back, it'll be nothing. Which, whether that is just a personality trait that they knew about Lisa, or whether that is just how a lot of law enforcement, you'll you'll see it even nowadays, law enforcement will sometimes react that way. And it is true, nine times out of 10, if people go off, then they usually do return back within 48 hours. So that's when the, the real search began. Before that, it, it was mostly phone calls, uh, hoping that Lisa was, like Nick said, hiding out, perhaps staying at a girlfriend's house, which she often did. She often slept over at friends' houses. So the initial thought was that Lisa was at a friend's house until, of course, her vehicle was found, and then everything changed. Two days after her disappearance, her car was found by a farmer, ransacked and abandoned with no sign of her, when the police found it, and when the farmer found it, and then the police attended the scene on the Tuesday, so two days after she disappeared, it did look like someone had tried to move the vehicle. There was a piece of wood under one of the tires, a lot of footprints ar around it, and there were deep ruts in the in the mud. Because it had rained those few days, it had rained a bit, so it was a bit muddy. So it looked like someone had tried to dislodge or move the vehicle, but had failed. And yet it still took 10 days to do a proper ground search in that area and release the first newspaper article. Like, what the hell? Jeez. We, we were just baffled when we learned this. Why was it kept under wraps for so long? Keep in mind, two weeks prior, Lois Hanner, right? So that could have easily been playing a factor in it, that no way can this happen within two weeks in Gray and Bruce County? That very well could have played a factor. People had claimed they'd seen Lisa on the Sunday in Owen Sound, and now she's missing. So now it's a city police issue. 
So the Owen Sound police took it over. Then, during the course of the investigation over the next week, they realized that's false. Lisa wasn't seen in Owen Sound. These, these witnesses are not, haven't seen Lisa. She was last seen in Woodford, which is now a Gray County issue, which is an OPP issue. So that stymied the case from the beginning because first it was an Owen Sound police case, and then it got transferred uh, a week later, 10 days later, to the OPP. And that's when the real search began, the real ground search. So whether the Owen Sound police just didn't believe she was really missing or didn't want to alarm the public, the choice to do nothing in the first 10 days is just inconceivable. Imagine how her parents and friends must have felt. Such a helpless feeling. And as we know, the first 48 hours are crucial with any missing person's case. Every second counts. If it were my daughter, you bet your ass I'd take matters into my own hands, which is exactly what Ken Reimer did. As soon as police notified him of Lisa's car being found, he attended the scene and confirmed it was in fact her car. We will note here that a small black purse that Lisa had with her that night was not located at the scene of her car. Over the next few days, Ken organized his own search for his daughter, desperate to find her. The first person to actually search around the vehicle and Kiefer Falls was just to the east, was Ken. So Lisa's car was found on the Tuesday, and on the Saturday, Ken and some family members searched around Kiefer Falls, not the police. Like Ken pushed this case to the forefront. He was determined to find Lisa, find the truth, and from day one, and he fought like any dad should to try and bring back his daughter. And I have a lot of respect for Ken. He was searching every every free minute. He was retired at that point. So every free minute he had, he was walking the ditch lines. He was walking in fields. He was, he was walking in forests for, for years. He continued to search ground searches for years. The love that he had for his daughter, it can never be questioned. So just to get a visual, imagine in your mind Okay, picture Gary's house, then just two kilometers north off the beaten path is this farmer's road on which Lisa's car was found. This road led back to Kiefer Falls, once known as Slattery Falls. If you recall earlier, we mentioned that Gary stated Lisa drove south when she left the house. It makes zero sense then that her car would end up at this location if what he stated was in fact true. Her poor dad, imagine coming upon the scene where your daughter's car has been ransacked and abandoned. How horrifying that must have been for him. Jeez. Mm. So the farmer located her vehicle and then called the police and then the police then notified Ken. And then later that evening, Ken attended the property, the location and confirmed that it was Lisa's car. And at that point, Lisa's belongings inside the car were strewn everywhere, all around her vehicle, like it had been ransacked. Lisa's family waited an agonizing 10 days before they saw any action taken or real efforts made by authorities to search for their daughter. The OPP who had taken over the case led the first ground search in the area where Lisa's car was found. July 27th is when the OPP began their first ground search. One would hope that every effort was made to search the area in its entirety and secure the items found at the scene. God, you'd hope. Mm. Unfortunately, this was not the case as Lisa's father came to find out. Ken returned back to where her car was found a year later. I, I, I still, uh, items that were in Lisa's trunk. One of those items was a fishing net that he knew to be hers as he most likely purchased it for her. At the site where I was found, a, a year, a full year later. Like, that, that's all the example you need, that it, it was, it must not have been a proper search. Wow. wow. Oh my God. Again, this is unbelievable to me. Who knows what other potential clues could have been missed if this was the level of their search. Quite sad and shocking, actually. It is difficult for any of us who have not experienced our loved ones missing to understand how this must really feel. The woman we spoke with in episode one, who was at the pig roast the night Lisa disappeared, actually went through her own personal nightmare in May 2020 
when her 25-year-old son disappeared for three days. His body eventually found in a cemetery. The young man... The young man had been murdered. It was the most... You you know, as a parent, that something's really wrong. Something's not right. Your child needs help. Like, you know, you're in that fight or flight mode. Like, it's the worst roller coaster of a human's life and I would not wish it upon anyone and my heart goes out to anyone who's on that ride and I I pray that somebody out there that knows whatever brings Lisa home to her dad her family her friends because they have been going through torture it's torture like it's like you can't can't describe what you're going through in those days and hours and minutes and seconds when you know there's something wrong with your baby and you can't help them. You can't find them. I don't know if I'll ever be able to explain it, what it feels like not knowing. And then when they find them and they bring them home to you, as bad it is. Can't imagine what these parents are going through that don't know for like 20, 30, 40 years and somebody knows and they're not given those parents, those people that love that person, the answer, that respect. And, and the whole process too is very alone, very alone. You know, because everybody's there in the beginning. And then people, you know, forget. They walk away. I don't get why they could keep the secret. I just don't get it. Yeah, that's really tough to listen to. I know, I can't. I'm picturing listening to her. So sad. Yeah. Our heart goes out to Tracy. We can confirm that there was a piece of wood under one of the tires. Deep ruts and footprints in the mud surrounding Lisa's car. Apparently, it had rained for a couple of days prior. Police also stated that they did take Lisa's car to Toronto for forensic testing. Of course, we don't know the results of those tests and whether or not they took impressions of the footprints at the scene and compared them to those of any suspects. We also don't know whether they originally tested the blood to determine the blood type or how long it had been there. But we can only assume that they believed it to be from the night Lisa disappeared, which led them to test it again with DNA technology in 2006. We will discuss this in more depth a little later. A news report nearly one month after Lisa's disappearance brings us back to the first public search. 22-year-old Lisa Mass has been missing almost a month. She was last seen July 17th in Woodford, but her car was discovered two days after her disappearance in a wooded area near Annan. That's where OPP and volunteers concentrated this latest search effort. Teams made up of 20 to 30 volunteers each combed the roadsides and ditches between the two rural communities. One of the organizers who got the volunteers together, Ruth Ann Devlin of Owen Sound, says they were looking for virtually anything. They said that they could use the help, and if we could find anything, it would be of help. Such things as matchboxes, any kind of clues like that, that would sort of nail down the fact that the girl had been in a particular given area. So we're just out for anything we can find. Police have already carried out a number of searches in the area, including using helicopters and dogs. But with the exception of the car, there is no other evidence of Moss. The car was taken to Toronto for forensic examination. Investigators are still conducting interviews and follow up on other possible contacts. Moss, who is five to six months pregnant, is described as four foot ten inches, weighs 97 pounds with hazel eyes, spiked blonde hair, and she has a tattoo of a mouse on her right shoulder. She was last seen wearing blue jeans and a blue sweatshirt with a Mickey Mouse on the front. 
Lisa's dad was retired at this point. And up until the day Lisa's mother passed away, they would walk the roads together, looking for any sign of Lisa. My goodness. He would eventually become a strong advocate for his missing daughter, prodding police where to search and to search even harder, often joining them in this search. On a couple of occasions, he even joined them in their aerial searches. That's a dedicated dad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Heartbreaking. 98 years old and he still holds out hope. Mm -hmm. Cindy, the founder and administrator of the Facebook group, Let's Bring Lisa Reimer Mays Home, also joined in in the early searches for Lisa. It was on this first search that her driver's license was found. The searches that they did, like Shelly will tell you, they didn't let them go past the ditch line. Like, they couldn't go onto people's property. They couldn't, you know, they could only go so far. Yeah. And Shelly said it was really frustrating because, you know, you want to go further because, you know, that's only a certain, you know, kind of area. Like, it's only so big. Mm -hmm. And it could be beyond that, that, you know, you find something else and they just wouldn't let them. So, like, I don't know, they kind of shit the pen on it, to be honest. Yeah. You know, like, a lot of stuff they didn't, you know, like, they followed people around. I know that, you know, for years. You know, but never got any answers. You know, so you obviously didn't press hard enough. You have to press, you know, like Matt and those guys have talked to people that have, you know, given them info and stuff. So why you know, why couldn't the cops do that? Then now, or well, it's closed now, but Tenneco, you know, in town, you know where I mean? So they put on the first, they donated and whatever so they so i lived in kitchener my sister myself my brother-in-law and roy which is what they call pinhead we all went and a few other people and that search was uh we walked all the ditch lines we weren't allowed on people's property so we weren't allowed to go beyond the ditch line anywhere which was stupid because we went from the Anna ball diamond almost all the way up to highway 26 and there might have been people there's a lot of people that's when they found her car on her license uh you know a few things so then they congregate us back to the Adam Ball Diamond where Mr. Reimer Ken was so Roy had a previous engagement and he had to leave which kind of pissed off a bit you know, the whole crowd because what's more important if they found something of your baby mama I guess you can say if they found something about her so why the hell would you leave you know it was very disheartening and it was just not a very and set up search by the police. Over the years, she has heard her share of theories as to what has happened to Lisa. In such a small, tight-knit community, it's difficult for locals not to speculate on locations that she could possibly rest. Locals say there are abandoned wells on the property where her car was found. There's a waterfall that was once used to power a grist mill, a clearing, and then the river below. All could be areas of interest. The clearing was also a well-known party place, locals say. That's the part that bothers me the most, is that, you know, I could be talking to somebody and they know exactly where she is, you know, and these and these are people that you talk to, you know, throughout the town, you know, kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. But I've asked people and I've got all different class of answers, you know, and I've talked to a lot of people and it's, you know, oh, she's here, she's in a crevice, she's in the dump, she's, uh, uh, where else? Oh, pig farm. Um, septic systems in an old well Mm -hmm. you know and it just goes on and on and on and on so you never know what the real truth to it is right and I think that's it's so frustrating because you know somebody that you've talked to knows the truth and we've heard all of this in so many cases girls where the public continues to repeat theories and rumors that they've heard about where a missing person has ended up. And again, it's heartbreaking for the family to have to go through all this and listen to it. Well, to hear some of these some of these things, pig farms and crevices and mm-hmm. w- worse things than that. And it's never our intention to continue to circulate rumors, but we have zero way of knowing, you know, what parts of these have any truth to them. So it's it's important to get the story out there in its entirety. Well, it could also trigger someone's memory. Yep. Now yep. that we're kind of telling, because we don't know what's true, right? 
So if we're telling different theories that we've heard, it may have someone go, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. We're just hoping for any kind of help. Absolutely. Well, and the sad part is there are people that know all the answers and yet the mm -hmm. family has to go through decades and decades of listening to all of this and picturing picturing the most horrible situations in their head. The Kiefer Falls area where Lisa's car was found was searched multiple times over the summer and fall of 1988. Aerial searches continued with the use of thermal cameras over other areas of Gray County, including the Bogner Marsh and east towards the Meaford Tank Range. Once the winter months set in, the search efforts halted. In the early spring of 1989, they resumed their search for Lisa, beginning with the Geno dump near Annan. By all accounts, they focused their search on the area of the dump believed to be used during the summer of 1988. The summer and fall of 88, the, uh, the OPP conducted a few searches. So they searched the Kiefer Falls area. Uh, back then it was called Slattery Falls. Uh, that's close to where her vehicle was found. That area was searched uh, multiple times that summer. They did ground searches. They walked around the Annan Dump, which is just northwest of where her vehicle was found. So they put helicopters in the air with uh, heat-seeking radar to see if they could find a body lying on the ground. Uh, perhaps, you know, Lisa was uh, stuck somewhere with a broken leg out in the forest that would have picked that up but they found nothing we've been told that the police received a tip that that lisa was put in the dump and that's a common rumor and, and if you if you interview locals a lot of people still believe that they still believe that lisa is in the end and dump the police at different times in different news stories have even commented that that's a likely scenario three minute drive north of his house to where Lisa's car was found, and it's another two-minute drive north, three-minute drive north to the Annan Dump. So it's all very close. It is very possible. It is, you know, while, while I personally don't believe it, she certainly could be there. They would have had the access. They would have had the time. There's only a, a very small fence that goes around the property on the south side, so they would have, it, it wouldn't have taken much to, to pull down a dirt road, taken Lisa over the fence, and buried her in the dump. It's very plausible. Although Matt doesn't believe it, nor has he from the beginning, he does acknowledge that it could be a possibility. So let's look at this for a minute, girls. There was only a short fence around the south side of the property with no other security. Yeah, that's right. And then the road to the dump was accessible. So seeing it was in the wee hours of the morning, the culprit or culprits, would have had access and had the time to easily dispose of Lisa's body anywhere in the dump, really. And just to give you another visual image in your heads, picture Gary's house. Then a three minute drive north is where Lisa's car is found. Then another three minute drive north onto the Annan dump. Pretty much a straight line. I can see why the locals would be fixated on this location. Mm -hmm. The OPP's next area of focus was the caves and crevices just south of the Woodford Party House. In September of 89, police spent several days with cadaver dogs scouring this treacherous terrain and utilized the skills of trained climbers who repelled down deep rock crevices in search of Lisa. Something had to have led them there, so whether it was a tip or a hunch, we cannot confirm. This area was a short walking distance from the house party. Just walk, you just walk south of the house through the, the trees and you get to those cliffs about mm -hmm. a 10 minute walk, 10 to 15 minute walk. So not very far. Minutes. Okay. So definitely plausible that, you know, they, they could have, um, Lisa could have ended up there. She could have staggered there, you know, if say if she was drinking, you know, she may have gone for a hike out there. I mean, there's uh, so many theories about what has ha happened if if she was uh, taken out there. But but certainly it's an area that um, is, again, plausible. And it's a place where if, if someone was taken to one of those crevices and, and put down one of those crevices or holes, unless you knew which one, it would be very difficult to, to find them. 
So like Matt said, that area would be like searching for a needle in a haystack. My thoughts are if it's a 10 minute walk from the house party, then what good reason would she have to wander out there in the wee hours of the morning in the pitch dark? What are your thoughts, girls? Seriously, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, we hours of the morning. Why? Like, it, unless you had flash. Why would you be even going there? I don't, I don't understand. It's a 10 minute walk. There's absolutely zero way I'd be walking in the dark that far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For any reason. Mm-hmm. The rumors are correct that she was, you know, dabbling in some higher level of drugs that perhaps she wasn't used to or got out of hand who's to say i mean it's a possibility but a 10 minute walk away from the party yeah it doesn't make any sense no no and without and a flashlight it, it, without a flashlight or without anybody following her or seeing her yeah just doesn't yeah. seem uh... if she was with someone else but then there would be a witness to what happened right that's right yeah well, sadly, that actually was the last search that police conducted for over 15 years. Lisa's case became rather dormant, and the talk surrounding it gradually subsided. Finally, in October 2004, authorities received a hopeful tip that would lead them to begin searching the crevices in an area known as the West Rocks on the west side of Owen Sound. OPP tactical units repelled into an abyss on a heavily traveled section of the Bruce Trail at the top of the Niagara Escarpment. Again, dogs were brought in and pneumatic devices were used to break up rocks and reach previously inaccessible areas. Ironically, this area was very close to where Lisa had once attended high school. Mm. The search, again, turned up nothing. But it's, it's funny how two separate locations containing rock crevices were searched based off of tips. I mean, you have to wonder where these tips come from. Mm -hmm. Either you were there and you witnessed the disposal of Lisa's body, or you have talked to someone who was there, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, otherwise, these tips could just be based off of people's theories or misinformation through the rumor mill, you know? It, It was very frustrating that no trace of Lisa was ever found. In 2006... DNA testing was performed on the small area of blood that was found on the middle of the bench seat in Lisa's car. Police revealed that they found there to be two different blood profiles, but they never released who the profiles belonged to. Of course. Hmm. We suspect that one profile could belong to Lisa, and we could speculate that the other could be Gary's or another male that was in the car, perhaps. The police obviously believed the blood to be from the night Lisa disappeared because they went to great lengths to test it and released the fact that there were two profiles. One year later, OPP announced that they had a suspect. An excerpt from an article in the Own Sound Sun Times written by Scott Dunn on December 21st, 2007 reads, Originally, there were seven suspects in the case which badly unsettled area residents in the summer of 1988. Now, the list of suspects has been reduced to a single name by detectives of the OPP's Historical Investigations Unit. Though they can't as yet identify the suspect, police say it is someone Mays knew. It makes it more palatable for everybody when strangers are involved, said Detective Constable Andre Bayard, a detective with the Cold Case Squad. Everybody wants to believe the boogeyman's out there and be wary. Well, you know, I've been doing this job over 30 years, and the boogeyman is usually somebody you know. Yes, it is. Mm Mm-hmm. The story in the Sun Times. So it was Friday, December 21st, 2007, and then there was one. Police have zeroed in on a suspect in the disappearance of Lisa Moss, and they think it was someone the young woman knew. It wasn't a random stranger. It wasn't a serial killer. It was someone who Lisa knew very well, according to the OPP. Officials have also never stated how they determined who the suspect was. Detective Constable Andre Baird was also quoted as saying, Last year, 
DNA testing yielded an individual profile from a blood sample taken from Mays's car in 1988. But more testing must be done to further narrow down whose DNA it was. And cold case DNA testing is a low priority task when fresh cases require DNA analysis too, Bayard said. So we could surmise that the police have likely identified whose DNA was in Lisa's car in the last 15 years, but without a body, they cannot prove a crime was actually committed. We will talk more, way more, about the suspects in the next episode. Three years later, in October 2010, OPP again received a tip which sent them to another property in Owen Sound, but this time it was along the east shoreline a couple of kilometers north of the Bayshore Community Centre. There was a property on on the waterfront you would drive by a hundred times and not even look at. In October, the end of October of 2010, the OPP descended on that property and did a massive search. They searched three days that fall. And then in July of the following year, 2011, they went back one more time, a fourth time, and again searched it and came up empty handed. Of course, we questioned if Please Bring Me Home was aware of any correlation of that area to Lisa in any way or why they would have searched there. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to guess the connection? Tell us. (laughs) Well, some of you may already be thinking it, so I'm just going to tell you. Gary's friend owned the property. He would actually allow friends to dump there as he was trying to build up his shoreline. People would come by and dump soil, clay, fill, and rocks, all that sort of thing. And at some point, someone told the police that someone known to Lisa had dumped there, which is what ignited the search. The male companion was friends with the person who owned that property. The guy who owned that property back in the in the 80s, he would allow people to dump there. He was trying to build up his shoreline, so he would allow people to dump. He would allow lots of friends there to dump, and then he would get top fill. He, he would get a soil dump there, clay, fill, uh, just to build it up. At some point, somebody mentioned to the police that the male companion had dumped there. Hmm. Yeah, but unfortunately, no trace of Lisa was found. July of 2011 was the last search made by OPP that was made public. Years later, Please Bring Me Home searched this same location multiple times, and in episode four, we will elaborate on their initial involvement in Lisa's case, along with their continued search efforts. Meanwhile, Ken Reimer keeps hope that one day his daughter will be found. Avery Haynes speaks candidly with him during a W5 episode entitled Bringing Hope to the Families of Canada's Missing. This episode introduces Please Bring Me Home and their efforts and successes with bringing the missing home. At the time of this interview, Please Bring Me Home was actually in the midst of a large excavation search for Lisa in Annan, Ontario. In order to avoid copyright issues, we've enlisted the help of a voice actor here. In 2019, Mr. Reimer was 95 years of age. He had collected boxes of information over the decades. Every newspaper article tips with dates and times, a box filled with memories without answers. When asked to describe all the years not knowing where Lisa was, he answered, We've been able to accept the fact that she's no longer with us. We um, find it very difficult to, uh, to place her anywhere in particular. But anyways... When asked what he meant by that, Mr. Reimer responded. You know, we we had a lot of stories. Some of the stories were, uh, they put her in a septic system, fed her to the pigs, uh, you name it. These things hurt, and with my wife passing, it doesn't help matters, you know. Ken's wife, Lisa's mom, June Reimer, had just passed a month before this interview. She was 91. 
When Avery Haynes remarks that his wife passed away without ever knowing what happened to her daughter, Mr. Reimer responded. No, she didn't know. We used to go out evenings and weekends, June and I. And we'd go up and down different roads. And I tell you, we just spent time and time again looking. So whatever happens, it's fine. He... We're very grateful. When asked if he had lost hope over the decades of ever finding his daughter, this was his response. No, oh no, never lost. Never lose hope of finding her. Eventually somebody will find her. Might not be in my time, but somebody will find her. According to Matt Knopper of Please Bring Me Home, Mr. Reimer continued to walk every ditch line, every field, and forest for years. The love he has for Lisa is undeniable, and Please Bring Me Home has assured him that they will never stop looking for her. If we don't find Lisa before Ken passes, I know that Ken feels now that if he were to pass on he knows that it's going to continue to be pushed and taken care of until she is found and i think i take solace in that at least every year we search for lisa every year where we search at least one location if not two every single year we search these locations because we get tips in. It, it, it has to be a, a fairly significant tip, or in a lot of these cases, it's several tips that point to a location, and then we'll search it, if what they're saying makes sense with what we believe likely happened that night. Please join us for episode three, where we will discuss the possible suspects and theories surrounding Lisa's disappearance. A couple of weeks after Lisa went missing and we were in a vehicle I was driving, and... Uh, it came over the news, of course, that Lisa was missing. So I chirped up to her and said, do you think we should go to the cops and, and tell them? And I can still see it to this day. I said, no, 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 it's okay. Those were his exact words. A $50,000 reward remains in place by the province of Ontario for information leading to an arrest and conviction in the Lisa Reimer Mays case. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Lisa Reimer Mays, Please Bring Me Home can be contacted via the email address pleasebringmehome at outlook.com or by calling their anonymous tip line at 226 702 2728 or you can contact your local OPP detachment. If you enjoy our podcast and would like to support our endeavors, a five-star rating and or review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts would be greatly appreciated. It really helps new listeners to find us. And we wouldn't ever turn down the offer of a coffee or maybe even a glass of wine. Helps tremendously to wet our whistle while recording. The link to our coffee account is coffee.com forward slash shedding light podcast. And that's spelled K O dash F I dot com. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Links to our coffee account, our Instagram, and Facebook page can all be found in the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening. We couldn't do what we do without you. And as always, this podcast is dedicated to Nolan Pantushin. We love you, Nolan. Love you, Nolan. Love you. The phone.